1626, not long after Francis Bacon had died, his utopian story New Atlantis was published. While unfinished and quite short, it would prove to be one of the most influential pieces of fiction ever written. It describes the land of Ben Salem, an island somewhere in the Pacific, home of a wise and technologically powerful civilization. Its crowning triumph is Solomon's house, dedicated to the study of the works and creatures of God. While the language is archaic, it is what we would recognize as a research institute. It has a wide range of experimental equipment available, including towers on high mountains for astronomical observations, botanical gardens with samples from around the world, breeding programs for useful insects, microscopes, telescopes, perpetual motion machines, ways to transmit sounds over long distances, and even something like a working holodeck. Receiving almost as much detail as these miraculous devices, Bacon described many of the responsibilities of different staff positions at Solomon's house. For the several employments and offices of our fellows, we have twelve that sail into foreign countries, under the names of other nations, for our own we conceal, who bring us the books and abstracts and patterns of experiments of all other parts. These we call merchants of light. We have three that collect the experiments which are in all books. These we call depredators. We have three that collect the experiments of all mechanical arts, and also of liberal sciences, and also of practices which are not brought into arts. These we call mystery men. We have three that try new experiments, such as themselves think good. These we call pioneers, or miners. We have three that draw the experiments of the former four into titles and tables, to give the better light for the drawing of observations and axioms out of them. These we call compilers. Empirical research was a subject near to Bacon's heart. He had written an entire book, The New Organon, trying to convince people that the deductive techniques of the Aristotelian scholastics had been going nowhere for centuries. He argued that, in contrast, the rough-and-tumble world of inductive reasoning shown in the humble crafts and trades had been making regular improvements. The only solution he saw was a radical restructuring of what it meant to investigate the workings of the world. Solomon's house was a fictionalized version of this, but he meant for it to be practiced in the real world. As a mildly corrupt official, he might not have lived up to these ideals, but he did manage to die in the pursuit of knowledge after contracting pneumonia while experimenting with the use of snow to preserve meat. The New Atlantis had a profound influence on the next generation of natural philosophers. Several groups of them started to coalesce later in the century, including one that met at Gresham College in London. In 1660, this group announced the College for the Promoting of Physico-Mathematical Experimental Learning, and in 1662, a charter was granted by King Charles II, officially founding the Royal Society of London. Just a few years later, on the 11th of March, 1665, the Royal Society recorded in its minutes the fateful decision to start publishing a monthly account of the activities of its members. That the philosophical transactions, to be composed by Mr. Oldenburg, be printed the first Monday of every month, if he have sufficient matter for it, and that the tract be licensed by the Council of the Society, being first reviewed by some members of the same, and that the President be desired now to license the first papers thereof, being written in four sheets in folio, to be printed by John Martin and James Allistry, printers to the Society. This publication had been preceded by the Journal des Savants of Paris by a few months. It's a matter of taste which of these two you consider the first true scientific journal, as the Journal des Savants included a wider range of topics than just science, and later became focused on the humanities. In either case, an important new tool for scientific research had emerged, the peer-reviewed journal. Henry Oldenburg, one of the Society's secretaries, had long been the center of a network of scientific pen pals, and as such he was the perfect person to try to bring all these updates together into a more polished, more public format. The Baconian influence could not be more obvious. Oldenburg even occasionally referred to himself as a compiler. He had obviously been preparing for the role, as the first issue is dated just five days after the Society had given its blessing. Oldenburg would end up editing the transactions until his death in 1677, but it never made him much money. The first few years for the journal were quite difficult, with an outbreak of the plague delaying publication by several months. This was followed by the disruption of the Great Fire of London the next year. The year after that, his extensive foreign correspondence helped land him in the tower under suspicion of spying for the Dutch. But luckily for us, he kept publishing. 
Those first issues featured an odd mixture of subject matter, combining experimental results, reports of deformed animals like portents in Roman history, grand theoretical explorations of abstract concepts, trip reports, news of the latest gadgets, and book reviews. They were working out what a scientific journal was as they went along, after all, and it was a gloriously weird and messy process. In a similar vein, I wish to announce a new video series, tentatively called Philosophical Reactions, to be released on the first Monday of every month. This will examine in detail the early issues of Philosophical Transactions. It'll highlight items of interest and try to provide some historical context to the best of my ability. The first episode will cover issue number one, though I expect after that most episodes will cover several issues at a time, and maybe even entire years at a time. But who knows? Like the transactions themselves, this project will likely evolve over time. I don't know how far I will get. Ah, uh, nor do I know how much interest there will even be in this project. I can only end with Oldenburg's own words from the first volume of Collected Issues, which he addressed to the Royal Society itself. In these rude collections, which are only the gleanings of my private diversions and broken hours, it may appear that many minds and hands are in many places industriously employed, under your countenance and by your example, in the pursuit of those excellent ends which belong to your heroical undertakings. This is my solicitude, that, as I ought not to be unfaithful to those counsels you have committed to my trust, so also that I may not altogether waste any minutes of the leisure you afford me. And thus have I made the best use of some of them that I could devise, to spread abroad encouragements, inquiries, directions, and patterns that may animate and draw on universal assistances. The great God prosper you in the noble engagement of dispersing the true luster of his glorious works and the happy inventions of obliging men all over the world, to the general benefit of mankind. So wishes with real affections your humble and obedient servant.